And thanks everybody for taking the time and interest with us to attend. We really appreciate it. And hopefully it'll have a, a pretty good uh, discussion today on our topic of 4G LTE, the CBRS. Broadband access everywhere for everyone. So why CBRS? Well, we know it's very uh, trending right now with a lot of activity around it and the, the ability of bringing it into our subscribers. Great alternative uh, technology and access to a hardline connection. And it's really good performance, even better in some cases that we see with other technologies. And uh, CBRS allows providers to kind of own their own private network, which makes it attractive for managing and maintaining their subscribers. So for rural environments, LTE is, is well suited. It helps with those hard to reach areas, as well as in the public sector, providing Wi-Fi, maybe in the downtown area, as well as uh, maybe a sports park. But other opportunities we do see is in education, education where they need fast, reliable broadband access in this new reality. It doesn't seem like uh, we might not be going back to school anytime soon. So we need a way to educate them and reach those students, as well as the ability of providing the connection, the access, whether it's in an indoor or an outdoor environment, having that ability to provide in those challenging deployment scenarios. CBRS is also going international. We see this advent. We've gone through our whole auction already in the States last year. And it's quite exciting to see different entities getting involved. But CBRS and the, the spectrum, it just doesn't stop at the US border. You know, it continues obviously, because it's not uh, you know, obeying those laws. So it's gonna be in different areas. So Canada, is also looking heavily into CBRS and providing this ability of fixed wireless access, utilizing that spectrum as well. They're planned to later this year, about mid range there, they're gonna have their own auction with their entity and looking at providing uh, the CBRS for the can Canadian market. It's a migration path with CBRS going into 5G. We hear a lot of talk about 5G, but really have we seen it? A lot of claims already, a lot of carriers say they have the largest uh, 5G networks, but we're still gonna see 4G pretty prevalent and going forward for many years, I believe. And the ability of the CBRS products to actually coexist and interact with 5G and having that ability to leverage and connect to the two uh, networks that are running simultaneously is huge, especially for providers who do decide to get into CBRS. And they say, hey, where's the, where's the roadmap? Where are we going to go? How far down the road will CBRS continue? And rest assured, it's going to continue quite a bit going forward for some time. And then again, you can leverage those networks that you build out with the 4G and interconnect those into a 5G network and still have devices to accommodate your subscribers. So we see a lot of opportunities with CBRS and LTE. Large carriers are getting into this, obviously, the wireless and wired, but we do see a lot of different verticals getting involved as well with the electrical real estate as well. So these properties and homes that are being built in different areas also want to offer their own internet broadband experience and utilizing technologies like LTE and CBRS to do that. We also see big energy companies as well as machine to machine with uh, different industries getting involved with CBRS, participating in an auction and reserving their spectrum to use for their solutions. For the case, use cases with CBRS, you know, we take a look at a couple of different varieties here the outdoor as well as the indoor. For the underserved areas, we know it's a huge challenge, but we need some sort of way to build the business case, right? To be able to bring that broadband there. And if we can't do it with traditional means of a hardwired connection like with fiber and, and presenting that case to the board and the company and saying, hey, we have to build out here. What's the return on investment? You know, that's the biggest question. So utilizing over the air technologies like CBRS can help 
provide that great uh, ex uh, system in place to build to accommodate high speed broadband when we see compared to other technologies like satellite or DSL, CBRS and fixed wireless access work quite well. Excellent for sparsely populated areas where there's not many uh, potential subscribers there. And with the outdoor environment with built-in directional antennas provides excellent coverage and connection to those cell tower base stations. Great for a single family or multi-dwelling. We see this opportunity here to provide another way of broadband access into those homes, as well in a multi-dwelling environment. Whether it's a true apartment complex with maybe 50, 100, 200 more users, or even in a hospitality environment where you have a hotel and providing high-speed broadband with a different uh, mechanism and you know, architecture to help provide that. Remote learning is huge right now. There's a huge push to get this taken care of. Many school districts are looking for alternative solutions to provide that broadband connection to those students and get their lessons taken care of. So it's, it's not a, a barrier to entry because there's plenty of opportunities available. There's so many schools around the nation that uh, they are actively seeking for help in providing this type of solution. The ability of you know, ease of use with security and a reliable connection and then for the actual students within the home, the less intervention, more automated setup, as well as the ability for video led uh, lesson plans is crucial. Also for small business, the ability of utilizing fixed wireless access and CBRS to offload that network and provide redundancy. In the event of high traffic, load balancing can be achieved by utilizing fixed wireless access and CBRS to help compensate that office space when traffic uh, data rates seem to climb, as well as a failover. So in the event that the main connection goes down, and it does happen from time to time, you can rely on a CBRS connection to keep the office up and running until that main connection is resolved and up and running. For public access, we equate, you know, high-speed broadband access and we go to, you know, the coffee shop or the shopping mall or outdoor venues like dining, as well as other areas in sport parks with the soccer field on Saturdays or the, the baseball diamond, you know, we want to have that access to be able to capture those moments, as well as in transit. You know, in the ability when you uh, commute, those of us who do utilize the train system or other public transportation, you know, that the ability of getting Wi Fi and broadband access and using a conveyance like CBRS can really achieve that. Also, for outdoor environment, you know, we are. We like to be outdoors, and we also want to enjoy the broadband outdoors as well, believe it or not. We think we want to disconnect, but we don't. You know, we want to share those same experiences. We want to keep up to date with what's going on, whether you're, you're camping, you're boating, or hiking around. And utilizing technologies like Wi-Fi just doesn't have the reach and distance that we really require us to roam around outdoors, where CBRS and fixed wireless access provides that ability. Then with CBRS and the communication between machine machine, right? The smart meters that are installed in most new homes these days we see, as well as in transportation at the, the traffic circles or the interstate, interstate exchanges, they need to keep track of all the cars that are going back and forth and utilize a very sophisticated system to do that with cameras and the ability of fixed wireless access like CBRS to help provide the conveyance for that, as well as uh, transportation and companies who do shipping. We see agriculture getting heavily involved in the CBRS and uh, managing the day-to-day the -day operations of uh, watering, feeding, and, and checking on monitoring the crops, as well as in shipping for the, the boat uh, harbors and, and uh, the big ports. They also need 
some sort of wireless conveyance and technologies like microwave or Wi-Fi point to point sometimes suffer in that case. So utilizing technologies like CBRS can really improve the performance and the connectivity in those applications. So Rochelle, let's go ahead and fire up our, our first poll of the day. Absolutely, the first poll, let's see here. What is your preferred 4G LTE CBRS deployment application? Public broadband access, education, rural broadband, or residential multi-dwelling? Let's wait for that answer. All right, so far. All right, rural broadband. Well, rural broadband, excellent, interesting. So I was thinking maybe education, but rural broadband really is uh, kind of the leader, definitely. Excellent, thank you, Rochelle. Thanks everybody for participating and we will move on. So outdoor CBRS CPE. So we, we have those two variants that we talked about. And typical application, this could be a single family, multi-dwelling, a business, but we are adding the outdoor LTE, CBRS, CPE, that feeds into a gateway within the home. For your subscriber, whoever that customer is, all they know is they equate that Wi-Fi experience to the internet. And they, they, they put the two together. We know on the back end, it's, it's much different. There's a lot of moving parts. However, that's their whole world. So whether they have a hardwired connection or if it's over the air with CBRS, they really not worried about it and not thinking about it too much. They are really concerned with what's going on within their world. That way you can set this product up easy to connect and point it just to the base station. You're pretty much ready to go. That's done with the built-in directional antennas. Now I know you look at it and you say, wow, it looks like an antenna or this is an access point, but it's really a full CBRS CPE that works in delivering broadband over miles. That we're not talking the feet that we usually do, like you know, 200, 300, 1,000 feet. No, this is miles. So it's really conducive for those areas. Well suited for compensating with the obstacles in the way. So you have, you know, buildings, the trees, the foliage, even hills can uh, help with propagating that signal across. Utilizing directional antennas, it focuses or beams that signal to the base station, just like you would with a flashlight at night and you're focusing that light on a certain area, works in the same process. And excellent for a full 360 degrees, depending on where your subscribers are at, your, to your base station, it'll point and connect to that in your uh, larger serving areas for your customers. So we employ uh, a mix of the, the wireless module as well as four radios for antennas that support the multiple in, multiple out MIMO that we're all used to. We, we see this with Wi-Fi and it's the same type of technology, you know, aggregating that connection to multiple sending and receiving paths to help improve the connection. As well as we employ carrier aggregation. So we see this, we see CA quite a bit in a lot of documentation and online about our wireless products, especially with CBRS. And what this really does is it takes those frequencies from the base station and it kind of combines them together to aggregate them, just like we would do when we aggregate uh, connections together to get higher throughputs. That's the same process here. We're just doing it with frequencies. So it does require that you do have that same type of carrier aggregation support on your base station equipment and the radios on the tower, as well as obviously as your endpoint. If you're one of the two are not supporting that or enabled, then you're not really gonna get the full benefits of that connection where you get the double speeds. And that's where we see these higher throughputs that we're able to achieve. So it's still kind of a two way street when we do this. With a carrier aggregation, there's many different techniques used to allow us to combine those two or multiple frequencies, I should say, together. 
and you can see from just the different profiles here, we're utilizing uh, two carrier aggregation for a downlink with four radios, four antennas, and then we have a two carrier aggregation for the uplink. Then we have a four carrier aggregation down with uh, two uh, multiple in, multiple outs, and then aggregating those together to high, higher throughputs. So depending on your model, the products you have, or what your base station can tower can support, you can utilize these and enable these options to be able to have that higher bandwidth in communication. That antenna uh, diversity is built in as well. Since you know, most of our products you'll see these days don't have physical antennas on the outside, especially within the, the residence of the subscriber. We found over the years that you know subscribers tend to play with the antennas and then eventually they break off because they keep moving them around trying to get a better signal. To alleviate that, we go with all internal antennas. <coughs> that helps with providing the ability of getting the best quality signal by automatically selecting what we call a transmission mode and as you can see from this list here, different types are utilized depending on what you're trying to do. And it works with both the directional type of antennas that are set up like in our outdoor or in an omnidirectional where it's 360 degrees. Fully uh, protected enclosure for the outdoor CPE. It doesn't make sense to have something that's not ruggedized for, for the outdoor environment. Fully protected Connections and covers help ensure that the, the hard line connection going into the home is protected as well as the SIM cards uh, with a protective grommet. So IP68 rating helps protect those extreme weather environments and allow the product to be set up and not have to take it down every time you're, you're finished using it. It's always up and ready to go, especially for some public opportunities where uh, you want to leave the product up and not have to cut, send a crew out every time to change out the equipment or, or re remove it. Three different types of SIM cards are available with uh, most of products out there. So if you have the normal, the mini size, the micro or the nano size, you know, it's fully supported, put it into the SIM card slot. All CBRS devices will utilize this type of format uh, to allow it to connect and, and write information to the SIM card. It's so, well easy to set up within the home. So uh, once the device has been set up on the outside of the home, it's gonna be fed in through a standard ethernet cable and you just simply connect it to another router. If the subscriber already has a router or you need to source a router, as long as it has an ethernet port RJ45 with the internet connection, the two devices will interconnect. The outdoor devices do provide power over ethernet. That's pretty essential because there's usually in most homes or businesses, you're not going to find an electrical outlet on the side of the home and you need to be able to power this device as well. So why not power the device as well as receive and send data over that Ethernet cable with those eight uh, wires that are in there. Do connect it to a PoE injector that helps provide that once it goes into the premise there, then it'll separate at the PoE injector and send the electrical to the wall outlet and then pure data will come out and connect to a gateway. For the indoor device, let's take a look at that. And it's sim setup is pretty similar, except we're totally indoors at this point. So the LTE, CBRS, CPE, that'll connect to the, the base station tower that's associated with it. Utilizing a different antenna setup, the omnidirectional, and it pulls that signal in. Then it offloads, as you can see from the far right, to your residential gateway. You know, in this example, we're using Wi-Fi 6, but it can be Wi-Fi 5 or 4. And again, all that the subscriber is really concerned with is that ability of Wi-Fi as the internet. As long as my Wi-Fi is working, I know I have broadband, even though there are a lot of other technologies involved and in how it's delivered to the home is totally oblivious to that subscriber. With that internal design of the omnidirectional, it works quite well up to uh, 23 dBm. And it has, again, four radios, four antennas that are built into this product to allow it to connect, utilizing the multiple in, multiple out. Quick comparison with 
technologies, devices, and their antenna configuration. In the CPE, the CBRS, uh, we have the LTE 5388, which we'll talk about. It has four radios, four antennas for the, the cellular CBRS. It does also have two radios, two antennas separately for management on 11N. So we'll talk about that coming up real quick. But most devices, believe it or not, your smartphone that you have right now next to you or your tablet could have anywhere from four up to 13 different radio interfaces built into it, believe it or not. How do you cram all that in that little device? Well, as you know, there are different interfaces. And other than the cellular, there's a Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth, GPS. So there's many different ways that allow you to connect. And in some cases, if you have, we'll just say, hypothetically, you have 13 in radios and antennas in the device, how do you fit all that in there? Well, some of the manufacturers will use a technique called swapping modules where they utilize maybe, we'll just say four of the, uh, the radios and antennas and swap them out between different technologies. So one minute, uh, you, you might be on cellular, you can have the Wi-Fi on, but then uh, if you turn Bluetooth on, then it'll add another uh, to that, those four radios and utilize that as well. So it does uh, some switching back and forth between the technologies, depending on your device. However, with the, the, the CPE, it's a full dedicated four by four for the cellular network. And it's a lot, a little bit taller, as you can see, and it really actually pull in the signal quite well. Uh, a while back, not too long ago, we were on a, a customer conference call with a Zoom and video streaming. Our customer was utilizing this same LTE 5388 during our Zoom video call. Excellent quality, no breakup on the audio. It was just like he was using a hardwired connection. So placement in the homes or business, usually you want to see this pretty close to a window seal because it's going to get a really good connection. Uh, it is, uh, we've seen distances from five up to 10 miles and maybe a little bit more depending on your density of the towers and where you're at. Nice thing about these indoor devices is it doesn't require the SAS certification or registration to work. So it, it does connect to that third tier, which is really ideal, especially for a lot of providers who want to kind of forego the extra fees that are associated with that. You can actually send this out as a self-install type of device. The subscriber just plugs in the SIM card, plugs in the power, and they're pretty much ready to go. With that set up, again, at the bottom of our device, we do have a SIM card slot, and it utilizes any three of these SIM cards that are available. You plug in the power, push the power button on the device, and you're ready to go. You're obviously going to need to connect to a, a secondary router, a gateway that's already probably in most homes that allow the connectivity. So that leads you to the question, what do you, it's really conducive for self-install and easy for the subscriber. They just plug in a few things, pop in the SIM card, the power, or do you have a professional stall where you have a white glove service that handles all that? We are pretty much a service oriented country here in the United States and we like to have people you know, assist us and provide that, that service hands off where I don't have to worry about learning anything, getting dirty, they're gonna take care of it for me. So with indoor and multi-dwelling hospitality, we kind of alluded to this, this gives a, a great conveyance to provide alternative broadband connectivity with CBRS into these opportunities. In some cases where you come across where you have an opportunity to uh, go into a, a multi-dwelling environment, but you don't have access to the infrastructure. You know, you're not the, the incumbent that's already in there. So here, utilizing an indoor CBRS, CPE, these can actually be provided to all those subscribers, all those renters, or people who are in the hotel room and utilize this connection. From the outside, all you're doing is beaming the signal from the, the base station tower and providing connectivity without having to touch any of the existing infrastructure within these buildings. It makes it really conducive and allows you to have an opportunity to be competitive in some of these instances for deployments. So now we'll take a look at 
we spoke a little bit about the SAS, right? The Spectrum Access System. What this is really intended to do is allow incumbents who are already using these frequencies from the 3.5 to 3.7 to continue to use their, their frequency, as well as prevent any interference from the other new devices, say like in the third tier or the priority access licenses to interfere with those signals. And it manages all this together in its own ecosystem. So that's done through the SAS process. So you know, the, you know, the device like a, a, a base station tower or our CPE, that's a CBSD, will connect and register to the spectrum access system. There it's gonna inquire and ask to allocate some spectrum to it. Also, it, it, it looks at the incumbents that are already there. So that way it doesn't run into any issues with interference. That device will go ahead and once it receives its frequency, it'll start to communicate and operate. And once that device disconnects or shuts down, then that same frequency can be put back into the pool of the SAS and recycled for others to utilize. In its ecosystem for the SAS, uh, there's an environment system uh, sensing capabilities. That's, uh, those are the part of the system that keeps track of all the users that are utilizing the SAS system whether it's incumbents like the military or satellite providers or uh, in the uh, priority access licenses, those will be tracked and, and maintained in the spectrum access system, a database. So when those towers connect or our CPE connects, it'll be part of that system. It's registered and allows it to operate and maintain different areas. As you can see, there's gonna be several different CBRS networks throughout the nation. And it's not just on the coastal west or east coast or in the Caribbean, right? It's gonna be everywhere in places you wouldn't even think in landlocked areas like Montana. They still have naval uh, military bases for training and they might be using some of this spectrum as well as other satellite providers throughout the nation. So it keeps track of all these networks, intercommunicates and utilizes a system called the domain proxy to be able to help speed up that communication between those connected devices through the, the sensing network, as well as the base station towers and the CPEs that we're deploying. For security, we do utilize uh, certificate authentication Digital certificates are utilized because different, other than just physical people checking and allowing for, you know, uh, sending your credentials, devices don't really have that capability, right? How do you identify a device and make sure it's, it's not a rogue device? Well, we utilize these certificates to be able to do that and employ that into the device. So once it joins, it shares its credentials with the system, it authenticates that, and then it's allowed to join. If it was something that was rogue, you know, it would have to go through all these countermeasures to be able to, to allow it to be authenticated. And in the case of it's not, it'll be just rejected. So taking a look at some of our devices in the last mile. In the categories, there's uh, three different categories for CBRS. The first category is a category A, CBSD. This is a device that can be used indoors or outdoors. It's allowed to use up to about one milliwatt and there are requirements for when you place it outdoors, it has to be about 19 feet or below the height of above average terrain. So this is simply something that a, an end user subscriber is not able to achieve. Plus we wouldn't want our potential subscribers to go up on the top of the roof and try to attach this equipment. It could be quite uh, perilous for them. So it does require a professional installer to get involved and help uh, put this together. For the category B, we see a lot of this. This is predominantly, you see a higher output and especially for conducive for rural applications. And you do see this mainly with uh, the base station tower radios, right? But our CPE that is also rated for a CBSD in class B can also be deployed in this fashion as well. So there's no height limitation. Again, it does require a, a professional installation required a CPI. 
that CPI or certified professional installer is someone who, who's familiar with the FCC part 96 rules and is familiar with the ins and outs of the CBRS and how to deploy this product and make sure it meets those requirements. Again, something that uh, an average subscriber uh, wouldn't really know and relying on a professional installer for the outdoor environment is pretty important. With CBRS and the EDU, the end user device. So the end user device is basically all the subscriber equipment that's gonna go in there. It meets a specific criteria for what we call citizen van equipment, or we call it EDU, end user device. It's up to about 200 milliwatts, 23 dBm, indoor, outdoor operation. And the nice thing about it is, again, is it doesn't require the SAS to manage these devices. The SAS will know that those devices are connecting to the network in that third tier, but doesn't require registration, which means you don't have to forego the cost of an, uh, uh, accessing the SAS every time you go to connect. So there is a associate fee every time you use the SAS to, to connect your device where these EDU devices don't incur that. So there's a wide range of EDU devices in CBRS. You know, we're gonna see a lot of consumer products. Right now, there's a, a quite extensive list and you can see that on the OnGo Alliance website, they have a list of all the current CBRS EDU devices laptops, you know, obviously smartphones, push to talk technology for business like walkie talkies, as well as uh, security with cameras, door sensors, and uh, chipsets, as well as uh, USB type dongles that are going to be uh, working with those CBRS and EDU devices. So a quick overview of what we're talking about in an indoor and an outdoor type of device for EDU. So Professional installed definitely for an outdoor, where indoor you can have that professional installation or you can go with uh, user self install. Doesn't require a SaaS engagement. So that's kind of nice. You do save costs on the fees. You can connect to it freely like a private uh, network, as well as it does require secondary router, a gateway. So most people will probably already have this, or maybe they have a home mesh system. They can interconnect those easily via the RJ45. And again, it's gonna provide that same environment of Wi-Fi is the internet. The subscriber really won't even worry about what they're connecting to. And then for the management aspect of it, uh, you can utilize a cloud system or your standard TR69 ACS system can work in conjunction and help you manage these EDU devices. So with the SAS requirement, again, you know, a lot of questions come up with that. Do we require SAS? Only if you're a category A or, or B type of device, you're gonna need uh, the register with a SAS, which has some fees associated with it. EDU devices, on the other hand, do not. They fall under that third tier, the general authorized access, which means it's just you kind of freely connect like you do with Wi-Fi and doesn't require SAS registration. Now with the management of it, there's two ways to be able to help provide this solution for your subscribers and maintain their environment with a local site management. And that's done via a, a wireless interface with 11N. You say, okay, well, I can, you know, you're utilizing just 11N because you're not really doing it. It's not for intended for the actual subscriber. So you really don't need to have that extra expense of a dual band system in that outdoor device. Here, you connect with the Wi-Fi on 11N. It's a hidden network that's not broadcast. And then you use your devices like the laptop or a smartphone type of device and interconnect and make the local adjustments when you're on site. You can also use the app to help set this up as well. So it makes it easier. You can, without having to gain entry into the home, you can drive up in your service tr truck and administer this product via the Wi-Fi. We have a nice intuitive dashboard with snap-in tiles. It allows you to kind of navigate through and see all the pertinent information at a snapshot view, right? In there with all the system information, the uptime of the device, the 
current firmware version as well as the connected device, that gateway that's behind it and the cellular information. Also, we do have a, a really fast responsive web interface built into the device. So you can log into it and it works with multiple screens. So you don't have to no longer pinch or move or enlarge the screen to type in text or see what's going on. It conforms to that device's format of whatever screen size you have. And it works with different uh, operating systems on you know, your smartphone or your computer. It's agnostic and it's not an app, even though it looks pretty snazzy like an app, it's not really not. It's built into the actual gateway. So you don't have to download another separate application from the app store to be able to do this. It's built into the device. We do have an app that helps set this up and it's really intuitive program. It shows you how to set this up kind of navigates you and shows you the features of the app as well. And then you can use this like a compass and you find your signal strength. It shows you all the vital statistics and signal strength of your CBRS connection. There you can use it to point to the base station and it even has a map view so you can kind of pinpoint that and see where it's at, save that location to lock it in. This is free to download. It's an Ally app from Zyza. We also have the cloud manager option called Band Pilot. So Band Pilot is an instance where we host this for you and gives you cloud access without having to forego the full infrastructure of having servers and maintain it with an IT staff. Here, you can actually use some of your uh, tech support or CSRs to help manage the LTE environment. And it doesn't uh, matter if it's CBRS indoor or outdoor, it supports all our formats that are available. So you have full access without having to be there on site, zero touch to see the entire network. Also the network information as well as the mobile cellular LTE CBRS information. You can do the routine maintenance of configuration updates or firmware changes that you need, whether it's instantly or offloaded for scheduled at later off peak hours. And then analytic data built into it so you can see what's going on and help provide solutions for your subscribers when they run into some issues. With the dashboard, very intuitive, shows you all your connected LTE CBRS devices, shows you their uptime, and you can drill down into those devices and get more detail. We also have a linear view that shows all your connections, whether they're connected or not in your instance, as well as the ability to search. So if you have a large serving area, we'll just say hypothetically, you have a hundred users and you wanna kind of concentrate on 20 of them. You can do a search based on criteria of their device name, serial number, their IP address, and then it'll display those units there. From this main display, you'll see the, the, the product as well as the serial number, the IP information, the, the device and firmware, as well as all the applicable uh, statistics on the RSSI, the RSRP information there. You can also export this but at the very top right-hand corner for Excel for offline viewing. Then when you click on the link to go into that specific uh, CPE device, then you'll get a detailed view and it shows you all the current information, uh, uptime, the last time uh, you accessed it, and you can go through the different tabs and see that specific uh, LTE information for the CBRS here. Down below, you can click on a link and get into the map view. And here you can see where your devices are deployed. If you have a few deployed in one area and then you can scroll around and look for that device and it shows you its location to make sure you're tracking those assets that are deployed. Then you have the, uh, analytic historical view. So he keeps track of the subscribers activities as far as the signal strength. Here, in the event that a subscriber calls up, your CSRs will say, hey, you know, it's slow performance. It's not really that fast. Last night at about six o'clock, what's going on with your service? You can actually dial back in time with that subscriber and see what's going on. If there was any outside influences, interference or Maybe just someone in the home was downloading just a little bit too much and you can pinpoint that out to them and hopefully provide a resolution to their, their issue that they're calling about. 
Then with the firmware updates and configurations, you have that ability to do instant firmware update or configuration change on the fly or schedule a batch. So say you have a, a certain serving area of, we'll just say 15 uh, devices, CPE, you can schedule those to run at an off-peak hour and a minimal disruption of service for your subscribers. With management as well, we talk about TR69 and broadband foreign spec. We follow that, including our LTE CVRS devices. And we employ the IP pass-through management option that allows us to pass through the device and allow for management of a connected gateway behind it. In most deployments, we will deploy this in a bridged option. But as we know, when we deploy in bridge, it disables all the functions, including the firewall, and it doesn't give you visibility into the actual LTE CPE CBRS device. To do that, we employ IP pass-through management. It essentially allows you to manage the device, but still pass that LTE uh, signal to the, the, the intended gateway behind it. And then you can have the ability of managing those devices and seeing what's there, as well as avoiding the complexity of having a double NAT situation where you have uh, uh, LTE CPE in NAT mode, and then you have a router that's also in NAT. So we do know that that does uh, create some complications for the end user and we try to alleviate them as we can utilizing IP pass-through. So Rochelle, let's go ahead and bring up our, our, our second poll here. Absolutely, our second poll, what management option would you prefer for, oops, sorry about that. For 4G LTE CBRS CPE. All right, it looks like cloud management. Yeah, it looks very interesting. Yeah, cloud management seems the way to go. I mean, we've been using some of this cloud for some other devices in our industry and it makes sense to have that for LTE and CBRS. Excellent, thank you everybody for taking that time to participate in the poll. We will continue. So take a look at the Zizel CBRS devices in our portfolio. So we have three of those that are currently available and ready for you and your opportunities. We have our outdoor LTE 7485, which is the CBSD category B outdoor router. And we have the indoor LTE 5388 and then the LTE 7480. Some of those high level features that are imported into our devices are the multiple APs support, just like you would on your mobile phone, you have that ability to do that. That's part of the roaming option. So you can move from your, your network within, within the network or outside your network, you have that ability. Even though this is a fixed environment for deployment, it still has those same inherent things and you may be in a vicinity where you can uh, take advantage of multiple tower connections. We also employ the PCI log, that's the physical cell identification. Usually CPE devices, LTE or CBRS will lock into a good quality connection or, or frequency. And in some cases it kind of hops around and it looks for the best one on auto selection. So in some cases you may need to prevent that. And what we do is we use the PCI lock to lock into your network tower that you prefer. You can either do it automatically or just specify a specific tower and help ensure that connection. And then with the late rate limiting, it gives you the ability to kind of uh, traffic shape the, the connection. And in the event you wanna add like tiered services with different service packages, maybe something that's low like a 25.5, or maybe you wanna do a 100 or 50, you can do that. Or in the event, and some providers say, well, we use this in the event of non-payment, uh, instead of taking the whole uh, device offline and then having to reinitialize the SIM card, we just dial down the service to zero. And then once the subscriber uh, reestablishes payment, we'll dial it back up. So it's options that are already available in all these products you can take advantage of. Again, uh, 
uh, available with our current line of CBRS. With the outdoor LTE 7485, this is a CBSD, which means it has a higher output, really conducive for uh, connections in a rural environment. We do have a built-in onboard SAS agent that connects with the interop of SAS. And we are certified with three SAS vendors, Comscope, Google, and Federated Wireless for SAS uh, certification. Again, two carrier aggregation with the four radius, four antennas, the wireless uh, uh, chipset module, time division duplex configuration two for the asynchronous, as well as uh, Qualm support with higher throughputs. As well as we're certified with uh, FCC and ONGO, we are supported on GO, which is now changed. We'll talk about that uh, with a new naming uh, to allow for more technologies of wireless. For the end user devices, we have the indoor LTE 5388 and the outdoor LTE 7480 up to 580 megabits on a category 16. Uh, we do have an omnidirectional for the indoor and directional panel for the outdoor LTE 7480, all of which include four rays, four antennas. Again, the same carrier aggregation, with time division duplex configuration, and it doesn't require a SAS uh, registration for these end user devices. So we come up to our Q&A session. I think we have some questions out there. What do you think, Rochelle? Yeah, yeah, we have a pile of questions. First question, does SASO make a CBRD based station or is it IoT only a CPE product line? That's an excellent question. We've been asked that quite a bit. Do we create the, the base station equipment? We are really known for our last 2000 feet, right? We, we are the CPE. We've been making modems for, you know, centuries now. Back in the days of dial-up, we were the king. So that's our, our main focus. Now, there are vendors who do the full tower radio base station, but our core competency, what we really do well is that CPE. And we do see a need for that because there's a lot of base stations out there and we do the interop, which is a lot easier. We have chipsets that are very compatible with the other vendors of base station radio equipment, which makes it an ideal situation. Now, that way it gives you the flexibility to select the equipment and then source that CPE from us to be able to work in your system. All right, next question. What is the max range KMS and I assume NLOS? Okay, so you're talking about the, the line of sight. So we have done several field trials and we're already deploying right now. And we've had C in the minimum, I'd probably say like five, six miles is really the good starting point. But we've seen it go as far as 19 miles, almost 20 miles in distance. And that's compensating outdoors, line of sight, in near non-line of sight. So if there's obstructions, we use beam forming within our CPE and our, and our directional antennas to help propagate that signal across. And, and does work quite well. Believe it or not, you would think it would get lost in the air, but it doesn't. It makes its good connection. The challenge is when we come into from outdoor to indoor, <clears throat> we tend to see, you know, what can we do to help improve that? Because we've got the, the structure of the home and a lot of homes, even newer homes really are not, you know, built with wireless in, 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 its, in, its, in its design. So we're still kind of limited. Only recently in the last couple of years did some uh, manufacturers of homes kind of outline it for like Wi-Fi, but really it's the mobile device that we're still challenging. We put, looked at the antennas and the smallness of the, the handset of your mobile phone. And it, that's why we, we see ourselves moving around or in some cases to get a better signal, we have to go outside. But we don't really incur that with the outdoor CPE. It, it really kind of works quite well. So good question. Okay, next question, Patrick. From my real experience with CBRS, how far you serve depends on if your CBRS is above the clutter. So it is only miles if you are way above the clutter with your serving base stations, not if you are down in the clutter because 
gigahertz does not work well if you are NLOS. Is that correct with your experience? Yeah, that's an actually a really good observation. Yeah, there are certain instances where it may not connect that well, depending on, like you say, how much clutter there is between uh, deployment areas. So really, it's kind of a trial and error. And, you know, in some cases, we got to do some sort of site survey, you know, whether you're using some uh, really sophisticated tools, use our app or other third party apps. I use some third party apps for LTE to check the signal strength and link quality. And again, depending on where it's at, you know, it could have some effects how well the terrain is if you're above or below a certain area to, to be able to get that near non line of sight. It's, uh, you know, it may take some testing to be able to move it around. That's why when we did some early trials, we drove around like uh, Oregon, 20 different locations and tried different heights and adjusting it to see how well we can get it to, to communicate. And, you know, it's not when you're deploying, whether it's fixed wireless or Wi-Fi or any other wireless, you know, it's not an exact science. It's a lot of trial and error to see how well those things work. But on the whole, it seems to work you know, pretty good. Okay. Okay, next question. We only have five minutes, Patrick. So oh, uh, we can goodness, only sorry. have, yeah, like a couple more questions. What is the noise figure of CISL CBRS CPEs? What is the noise figure of the CBE? Okay, so we're talking about the, uh, the patterns. That's a good question. That's something we'll probably need to look at. I don't know if we have that readily available, but that's something that we can look into definitely for sure. Good question. Okay. Uh, is there a limit on number of customers per base station? Right. That's a good question. Yeah, typically we're not going to, we're not in that side of it. So I don't really have a definite answer for you, but as you, you know, it's obviously going to be a, a one to many type of application. So that would be probably more reserved for the base station vendors to be able to to provide that for sure. Okay, this will be the last question since we only have four minutes. Um, what are the strategies to mitigate the effects of a DPA move list in areas close to the coast? Okay. Um, that one is also a good one. Uh, that one we haven't, I don't think we've really come across that to, to really see that effect just yet. So something that I could follow up with and, and see if we come across that with any of our trials. But I, I'm not uh, having, I haven't seen anything like that come up. So that's also a good question. Okay, I guess that would be it, Patrick. Um, you wanna announce the winner? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. All right, the winner for the Kindle Essential Bundle is Amy Davidson. Congratulations, Amy. All right. Um, Congratulations. Excellent. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, send you an email later on. All right. All right, just to follow up, close out for resources, go to our website. You can get all the information. We can download data sheets, uh, quick install guides, get information about the specs, about our CBRS products, as well as uh, you can go to the FCC, has a a lot of information about uh, CBRS and the 3.5 gigahertz. On uh, CBRS Alliance has changed their name to the Ongo Alliance. Now they uh, are going to include more products other than just CBRS as they see going forward in the future. So we'll keep track of that and it's a great source for information. Again, you can look at uh, information that's up there and available. Comscope for their SaaS system. Federated Wireless with their SaaS management system as well. And Google has a SaaS system as well. Keep up to date with your deploy products. Register if you haven't already with our uh, Broadband Solution Engineering site that has all our firmwares and documentation. Simply register 
and then you'll gain access. You can go, you can set up your own alerts to get when firmwares are released. You can look at the documentation that's available. For your questions, inquiries, opportunities, reach out to us. You can find us at broadband at title.com. If you're in the tier three space, you know your usual suspects there, Mike Scanlon in the West, Chris Lanier in the East. And in our key account direct sales, we have Linus Wynn in the West, Jennifer Mackey in the East. We have Michael Cooper in, in the great white North, as well as in the vertical markets, Francis Shin. If you work with our distribution partners network, we have six distribution partners, Border States, CSSA, Graybar, KGP, Power Intel, and Walker and Associates to purchase your products. In Canada exclusively, we have Alliance Corporation, Graybar, Hall Telecommunications, KGP, and Power Intel. Somebody raise their hand. I can see it. Okay. Hey Patrick, I can hear you. I, okay, there you go. All right, sorry. Yeah, no problems. Uh, so thanks everybody for taking the time, interest with us and spending your day with us. We really appreciate that. Make sure you follow us on the social platforms out there and we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Really appreciate your assistance with this. Thank you, Patrick. That was another informative webinar and Congratulations again to Amy Davidson, and we'll see you on our next webinar on March 25th. Save the date. Thank you, guys, and have a great weekend.